good good morning everyone i'd like to echo the uh, uh praises to alex for all the wonderful work in putting putting this conference uh together as um, was mentioned, my remarks are going to be on the International Court of Justice and the Armenian Genocide. And in preparing uh, my paper, I uh, was slogging through the various decisions, looking at um, arguments and, and uh, memorials and the like. And then one day, my father sends me an email and says, look what your sister found. And attached to the email was um, an interview that my grandmother had given to researchers at University of Michigan um, Dearborn. And we were completely unaware that uh, my uh, grandmother had made such a, a statement. And the statement is uh, translated into, into English. And I'd, I'd like to just take a, a, a few moments and, and, and give you some of the key, the key points because it helps shape then the issues relating to presentation of evidence uh, and concerns about uh, the International Court of Justice as an appropriate uh, forum. Uh, my grandmother in 1915 uh, lived in a village outside of Tumarza. Um, Tumarza is near Kayseri in Turkey. And she lived there with her mother and her sister. Her father had gone to the United States to work and so they were very lucky. Uh, the father was out of the country and was sending money uh, to the family. One day my grandmother learned that the local police had detained and beaten her grandfather uh, who lived in Tumarza. He was released but only after he paid a ransom. The episode was repeated and uh, it occurred not just to him but many other Armenians in Tumarza. And the local men who didn't pay died in prison. Women as well, according to my grandmother, uh, were beaten at this time. Not long after these detentions, word got out that the Armenians were being rounded up. My grandmother and her mother fled to Tumarza to be with the grandfather. And the grandfather was surprised. What are you doing here? We told you not to come to Tumarza because they're rounding people up here. They said they had no choice. They needed to come to him. Shortly after that, they were told to give up everything to the gendarmes, and they said, don't worry, you would receive your property upon return. Eventually, they were forced to march. Now, they took certain valuables and put, it down, uh, put them down a well, but they also had some money and they bought donkeys. And these donkeys ended up saving their lives to a certain extent because they were able to uh, every time the situation got bad with new, new police officers and beating, they would give them a donkey just to buy, to buy peace. They sold whatever they had on the journey for food and water, but eventually everything was gone. They were told when people were struggling, they said, don't look back, just let them go. And initially the group, they all two Marsans sort of said, so we're a community, no, we're going to protect our people. But at some point, uh, for surviving, the people had to move forward and not look, look back. Uh, to survive, they ate grass when they, they found it. They made their way to Syria, and that wasn't the end, though. Uh, they moved throughout the, the region. They were put in camps. We heard reference to the camps um, earlier today, and they endured substantial suffering there. My great-great-grandfather, the my grandmother's grandfather, who was in Tumarza at the, at the time and joined them on the journey, he died. And they buried his body, and then jackals ate the body. But the story of the family is one of how fortunate they were. Uh, my grandfather, as I mentioned, had gone to the United States. And through the church, they located uh, my, my grandmother and her mother, and they sent them uh, money. And uh, eventually, a man who had gone to the United States uh, with uh, my great-grandfather, uh, a man named Nurses Karmanian, was sent to go get the family. He was told to leave South Milwaukee, go find the family in Aleppo, and, 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 and bring the family back. He would marry my grandmother in Beirut. The journey didn't end. They went back and forth, Aleppo, Beirut, 
They went to Marseille. They're not allowed entry into the United States. So they go to Cuba. They're not allowed entry into Cuba. And they go to Mexico City. The entire journey from the time that the fleeing started until they were reunited with my grandfather, or my, my great-grandfather then, in the United States was 10 years. 10 years of being on the run with uncertainty and experiencing substantial horrors. My family's story of suffering and death is one of survival. Uh, the numbers of those who didn't survive, as we heard today, uh, those numbers are staggering. The perpetrators were discernible. Turkish police officers and soldiers who took their orders from on high. This, the interior minister made it clear, a plan to address the Armenian problem. The seizing of the property of the Armenians and the swift removal of them through their killing was a key element of the plan. After the extermination, Turkey signed the Treaty of Sev and admitted to a terrorist regime and admitted to the massacres. There were military trials of a handful of the perpetrators. The verdicts cannot be denied. Orders from Ottoman leaders, annihilation plans, massacres by drowning, hanging, and shooting, and stabbing, raping of women. Eyewitness accounts have documented the events. My grandmother's statement was given years later, but there are many others, including as referenced earlier today, reports, statements of non-Armenian diplomats and relief workers who made contemporaneous accounts of the events. The <laughs> files of the major democracies contain, uh, contain information about the atrocities. And uh, Mr. Robertson has, in his recent report, disclosed the files of the United Kingdom. A hundred years later, we sit in the, in the Hague the International City of Peace and Justice, home to the Peace Palace and other majestic buildings and institutions, and lawyers devoted to applying international wrong to remedy international, or applying international law to remedy international wrongs. I venture to say if I ask somebody in this room or anybody in this room who's, who, who is working in the field of international law in or around uh, The Hague, if you, you could raise your hand. I'm sure we have, we have a good group here. Okay? In our lifetimes, we've witnessed the intense focus on, quote, fundamental human rights, end quote, the foundation of the United Nations, established in the aftermath of World War II. We have understood that the killing of members of an ethnic or religious group are causing seriously bodily or mental harm to such group with the intent to destroy as genocide, the gravest of crimes. Under the Genocide Convention of 1948, states must prevent and punish genocide without regard as to when it occurred. The convention wasn't needed for this obvious rule. The prohibition of genocide is one that civilized states recognized as binding upon them. Enforcement of the duty rests not just on the state whose nationals have been victimized, Instead, all states, that is, all states are to stand in their denunciation of the acts and their demand for accountability. So with regard to genocide, we have international courts and tribunals, such as the International Criminal Court or the specialized UN tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda to try individuals accused of crime. In the aftermath of the Holocaust, we saw public trials of Nazi leaders. We've seen the establishment of a sophisticated regime for reparations. Uh, and that regime has targeted not only uh, the Nazis, uh, but also uh, private actors, such as financial institutions that facilitated or engaged uh, in wrongdoing. We've witnessed specialized courts, such as for Sierra Leone and Cambodia, and we have truth commissions, for example, uh, the truth commissions in South, South um, Africa. Yet for the Armenians, it seems that a critical, well-established development in international law, one that we all accept, one that many of you in the room are working on on a daily basis, has been bypassed. There's not been an acknowledgment of the gravity of the wrong there's not been a wholesale and widespread denunciation of the acts and of those who committed them. There's not been a holding of individuals and states 
accountable for major human rights abuses. The original wrong is compounded by the lack of accountability. On top of the original wrong and the lack of accountability is a third wrong, a culture of denial that pervades within Turkey and has influenced those outside of Turkey. And I may say it's not just a failure of the international system. Few remedies have been forthcoming in municipal legal systems. In the United States, for example, courts have gone out of their way to deflect the issue, largely deferring to the executive branch and that branch's refusal to acknowledge the genocide. Over the past few years, increased reference has been made to a case being brought against Turkey before the International Court of Justice here in The Hague. As the principal judicial organ of the United Nations, the ICJ hears cases between states in its contentious jurisdiction. It has limited jurisdiction based on consent of states. I have serious reservations about this approach. Of note, the Genocide Convention's Article 9 gives the court jurisdiction over disputes between parties to the convention, quote, relating to the interpretation, application, or fulfillment of the present convention, including those relating to the responsibility of a state for genocide for or for any of the other acts enumerated in Article 3 of the convention. Indeed, the court has heard major genocide cases principally two of them arising out of the demise of the former Yugoslavia, the Bosnia case and the recently decided Croatia case. In both cases, the court accepted a state could be held accountable under the Genocide Convention for the genocidal acts of state organs or those acting under its firm control, even though the convention speaks of individual accountability. This aspect of the judgments is critical, as otherwise the International Court of Justice would not be involved in assessing state responsibility for genocide. Further, in the cases, considerable attention was given to evidence, largely hearsay, as the court has not demonstrated a willingness to have live testimony. For the Armenian genocide, this approach is critical, as the witnesses and perpetrators are long gone. The evidence could be presented in such a case in a fairly defined way. We could have the findings from the military trials. We could have trial transcripts. We could introduce contemporaneous records of events found in government files, not just those of the files of the Ottoman Empire. We could have the reports introduced by, uh, prepared by relief organizations, and we can have victim statements. There would be additional evidence about destruction of records, which could aid in perhaps shifting the high burden of proof away from the complaining state. Turkey would mount a formidable defense based on the facts, uh, the fact of what happened, um, if in fact it would agree that there were these grave wrongs, but that individuals acted uh, beyond the control of, of, of the Ottoman Empire, that it, it was battling an insurgency, and we heard this discussion earlier today, and the challenge of trying to understand witness testimony based on statements like my grandmother gave and the fact there could not be a, a chance to cross-examine her. It will be very challenging, I think, for the complaining state to have a court fully convinced, and that is the standard the court has announced, of the genocide. The evidentiary issues are substantial. The court is one designed for states, and human rights claims require proof about individuals. And this case about many live stories would be difficult, I think, to present in a structured way. And throughout, after the filing of the complaint and the excitement associated with it, there's no question considerable time would pass if indeed the court ever held a hearing on the merits. And this leads to the major concern that I have, and that is this court has recognized that Article 9 gives it jurisdiction as to the interpretation and application and fulfillment of the convention, and not a customary prohibition of genocide. The convention uh, is the Convention of 1948, and as we all know, these events go back to 1915. The recent decision on Croatia could not be clear in terms of the court's limited ability to hear cases under the convention that lead to the that relate to the interpretation, application, and fulfillment of the convention, and not the customary norm. 
Now, the fact that the ICJ is not an appropriate form should not cause us to totally wring our hands in despair or otherwise rush to judgment that international law or law itself offers nothing. It's definitely not proof that a genocide did not happen. It's more a reflection on the institution itself, one that simply is not capable of managing a major human rights case arising out of events that occurred a century ago. The situation, I believe, should force us to look critically at other options. Ideally, such an assessment should have occurred years ago, but then the law was not as well developed as it is today and information was not available. And I think Professor Sonny last night uh, uh, succinctly discussed this issue about how over the last 15, 20 years things have, have changed. Another would be to look at different approaches uh, short of genocide. Now, in the focus on genocide, we have perhaps lost sight of other means to address the wrong. The Treaty of Lausanne does talk about the duty of Turkey to protect minorities. Mind you, uh, that treaty was after the genocide, but it could be used at least to address uh, claims for treatment of minorities uh, uh, from the date of the treaty in the 1920s and, until the present. One option I believe that we should consider is a bit of a piecemeal approach, and it gets back to the discussion we had last night uh, as well and some of the work that, that Dr. Uger has done, and that is on property claims. Uh, many of us uh, have uh, property rights in, in Turkey, and um, if we want to uh, begin to assert some form of pressure, it would have to come on an individual basis getting deeds, and that may be challenging, but making a claim to the property. And if, if you don't have your papers, but you can establish at least this is where my family lived, to at least try to make a claim, see if they will open the records, give you access to those. And then if the courts simply deny you your right of access to the courts for a full development of it, to assert a claim based on, on uh, denial of justice later before the European Court of Human Rights. A very challenging, time-intensive approach, but something that at least for individuals uh, is an option, okay? And there are gonna be a major hurdles to it, but at least to be able to, to, to uh, make a certain claim. Now, the key in my mind then is if, if there is a desire to have full accountability, uh, there must be some incentive for Turkey to realize this, come forward and address the wrong. And that will only happen um, if there is some pressure brought to bear. And I think that probably the pressure of individuals can only go so far. The biggest challenge and the one that we need to direct our energy on is just the states, the states that are committed to the principles set out in the Genocide Convention. As I said earlier, all states, all states should be standing up and condemning what happened and demanding an accountability. And so to the extent that these states of the world can do so and denounce the wrongs and the continuation of the wrongs. Until, until that happens, I think we're gonna be in a very uh, uh, difficult position. And so, but it does give us some sense of optimism if we can engage these states and ask them to fulfill their solemn duty. Thank you.